I'm not fucking with racism. You know what it is. You don't miss out on beef stew night, dog. Especially not when it's cooked by an Asian woman. Let me tell you. Beef stew cooked by Asian women might be the single greatest delicacy that any man can I have. guess I'm just the only one in the femdom here. So there's that. That well, You know what? Everybody's going to think I'm a weird. Everybody already thinks I'm a weird. Though. Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks. There's a lot to talk about. Like, a whole fucking lot to talk about. <laughs> There's a lot of shows airing. Typically around this point in the season, I've dropped everything but about three to four shows at most. And I'm still watching eight to nine, maybe possibly ten. And there's a couple that I'm actually behind on. And stuff like Dinazenon. And there's some other stuff that's airing that maybe eventually i'll get to but there's again yeah there's there's a lot to talk about i hope you guys have a uh, have had a good past two weeks i've been gone i didn't upload last week because i had a research thing that happened on saturday regarding psychology research i've been doing for the past couple of years and i also just had a bunch of work that was happening so there's that if you're regarding the psychology research, I'm not actually a psychology major. I'm a computer science major, but I've just been doing psychology research and things of the sort. So with all that stuff out the way, let's go ahead and get started. We are going to start with a couple of speed reviews, and I don't actually have any notes on any of these shows, be primarily because there was so much that I ended up finding in shows that I actually did do the rewatches of that I thought that there might be something interesting to talk about that I didn't actually think that there was any reason to go back and write notes on these i also just don't think there's going to end up being enough time and those three shows will technically four shows are shadows house megalobox jordan and nagatoro because uh, i have actually been watching nagatoro i just haven't talked about it on the podcast yet shadows house we'll start with don't have much to say about it <laughs> primarily because again it's a show that's so shrouded in its own mystery that it's hard to really give any sort of of criticism or discussion about it if it's if your discussion is not pertaining to how it is setting up its mystery or it's just theory crafting and i find no joy in just sitting here uh, just sitting down for five minutes and just theory crafting so regarding how it's doing its mystery i just think that it, it is doing a great job of coming off as really unsettling I, I think what was most unsettling, uh, I've watched every episode up till now. I think it's three episodes in. One one thing that was really unsettling in the third episode. So there's there's like this suit attack that happens. For those of you that don't watch the show, basically the idea is that these people are, there are like these dolls or quote unquote maids that are maids to shadows in this house. And they have to like clean up stuff around the house. And if they don't clean stuff up, it amalgamates like this dirt will amalgamate into some into something called a phantom essentially which is dirt that moves and is like a monster and eventually a phantom forms and it overtakes one of the people in the show and i found it to be absurdly creepy because not only is it just very 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 creepily well animated and it's all in ones and blah blah, blah etc it is also a jarring switch from the from the color palette that we've seen before it it's not nearly as i don't i don't think shadow house is particularly vibrant per se but it's not so heavily contrasted and dull and dark and black so the the really the heavy use of hard straight pure black is very jarring as well as the the nonchalantness seemingly that it seems like the cast has towards this moving piece of dirt that is attempting to literally suffocate and hang their friend <laughs> um yeah not maybe not nonchalant but they're a little more calm than i think most people would be in this situation as if it's an everyday thing and i found that to be more unsettling than almost anything so that was the only thing i really had to know about shadow's house it's still solid I just don't have anything to talk about because it's still shrouded in mystery and until it actually does something outside of the mystery we can't really say anything so moving on we have megalobox 
And Megalobox is something that I can't talk about because the discussion that I was going to have on Megalobox was centered around the idea of Joe becoming a mentor and swapping his roles and how I thought that the swapping of roles was interesting. The problem is, without getting into spoilers, somebody dies <laughs> and the person that dies is crucial to the idea of joe actually being a mentor which means that he can't really be a mentor anymore to anybody thus i don't really have anything to talk about with the show i will say that i think his name is milo or milo or whatever his name is he's he's not a thug anymore you know he's doing he's doing the black community right you know he's making us look good He's, he's giving up on the thuggery, the hooligan shit, the coon shit. Y'all love to see it. Y'all love to see what he owned. Get it back on track. You know what it is. That's all I got for him. I want to talk about Jordan. I really do. I'm not going to talk about... Oh, wait. Is the mic backwards? I've had the mic backwards like the entire time I've started recording this. So, excuse me on the audio, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about Jordan, but I can't. Because Jordan's third and fourth episode are so fucking good they're basically climaxes for every other series <laughs> and the idea that it's possibly climaxed in the third to fourth episode is in and of itself worth talking about but there are so many things that the episode does well and it's so fan they're so good i don't feel justified in just giving it a speed review segment it will get talked about next week more than likely i'll make sure that it gets put onto the podcast next week even if we have to go over what i'd Hope is kind of like a time limit that I set for myself in roughly an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. So no Jordan this week, but no, Jordan has been very good. <laughs> Jordan has probably been the second best show of the season, I would I would say. Nagatoro. Nagatoro I can talk about because talking about it's going to be very quick. I am one of the people that unironically enjoys the show. I don't know why everybody hates it so fucking much. I've heard reasons. Most of the reasons I've heard are that they don't like the weird ahegao, sadistic, psycho faces that Nagatoro makes. I guess I'm just the only one into femdom here. So, there's that, unfortunately. And I'm talking about, you know, East Asian femdom. I'm not talking about Western femdom where you just get thrown on a fucking stake and and pegged to death and as somebody stomps on your balls like I, i'm just talking about you know the woman basically making all of the advances but in this way that's kind of rapish you know like, you know what everybody's gonna think i'm a weird everybody already thinks i'm a weirdo i also think that i i don't even remember his name the main character which kind of will lead into my point I, I kind of thought that the bullying was justified. <laughs> so when, when he's crying in the first episode and a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, it's normalizing bullying and making fun of it. This is so fucking sickening. Ha 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 ha. I actually thought that he was deserving of the bullying because I thought he was pretty fucking lame. And you're allowed to like whatever you want, but he also had no balls to stand up for himself. And I don't know. I felt like the bullying was actually starting to make him want to change to some degree and he's learning to stand up for himself the, the the bullying is working in a good way <laughs> it's being it's it's constructive at least in this particular context i'm not saying the bullying is always constructive but bullying in this particular context is so i don't really have a problem with it i i've been enjoying the show for the most part if i had to give it a rating i probably wouldn't go any higher than five or maybe like a five and a half but it's still been a very solid watch it's been a decent watch now we get into the actual show show so we're no longer on speed reviews we're on real discussion we're starting with mars red uh, initially i wasn't going to do anything about mars red because i didn't think there was anything worth discussing i just had a bunch of fucking notes <laughs> that i would that i had on mars red which kind of obligated that i talk about it uh and give it its own segment first thing production I think is worth talking about it's one of the mars red is one of these weird cases of one of a show that might look better static than it does in motion 90 percent of the time <laughs> it the art direction is still gorgeous to me i still love the monotonic shading there's so much detail in the backgrounds and the environments there everything is patterned the, everything is just so detailed with that show in regards to setting, character design, so on and so forth. 
one thing that I did notice was the the fashion and the the representation of the period. I was I was interested because there's a line that's brought up in the show. I'm so going out of order of my notes, but there's a line that's brought up in the show by one of the characters, and it's an anecdote to the to the period at the time. So this is set in 1921, 1923 Japan. I, I keep forgetting, but uh, that is that's technically the Taisho era of Japan. And so he makes a reference that's like, quote, surely you grew up in the Taisho era, uh, era too. And that's like the female talking to him. And he goes, absolutely not. Do I look crazy for all things Western? I like learning about Japanese history via things like this. I, I After hearing this line, I, I went to go research. Well, quote unquote research. I really just did some Google searches and was trying to find some books and stuff about Japanese fashion and the evolution of Japanese fashion. I wasn't necessarily too concerned with the Taisho period itself, although context on that period is kind of helpful. Uh, without getting into too many details, because again, I didn't do too much research, the Taisho period in Japan uh, was this period in which people, or Japan, was starting to become more westernized in a sense. Westernized in that they they became interested in Western culture and started to adopt some of the things more than they had in, in eras prior. And I think that kind of makes sense because this is also around the time that musicals become a big thing, if I'm, co if I'm correct. I think his name is Floyd Weber, or whatever his name is. Uh, musicals become very popular around this time in the 1920s. I, it's particularly in, I think they become popular in West Europe before they become popular everywhere else. But my, my timing could be entirely back, or my, my locations could be entire, entirely backwards. I took a technical, his, uh, technical theater course, and so this was some stuff that was covered. But generally speaking, I'm not too surprised that that was the case. I just found that the show giving me some sort of history lesson via some anecdote, or at least inspiring me to go give myself a history lesson through some anecdote was very interesting. And if anybody has any resources regarding the evolution of fashion in Japan, like any books, sites that are they found useful, blah, 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 etc., please let me know. Because I actually do think that's a very interesting topic. I, I did think that from what I saw, the show did very well encompass what was what was standard at the time in regards to fashion it has like a bunch of patterned clothes clothes do look decently western although it's kind of weird to see because because the background people in the background are typically decorated in these you know they're they're cg and so they're not absurdly detailed even though they do look relatively western so there's that this show is still absurdly well shot Everything still looks like a movie in regards to shots, and that's why I said it looks better static. In in motion, Mars Red is not a very good looking show. It's not that's not to say it's poorly animated because it, it what it does well is it does do character animation well. It just doesn't do action very well. Action is kind of lacking both effects as well as lacking a lot of oomph. There's there's not a lot of motion in its action, and when there is motion, it tends to look kind of awkward. Uh, the camera movement is kind of awkward during moments, uh, during during action sequences. I actually remember a scene in episode two where like, there's like this vampire like bouncing around fucking everywhere, and I think it looks really odd. Um, but generally speaking, it doesn't look great in, in action sequences, and that, that forces the show to kind of rely on the power of its storyboarding, which it's just really good at, which is why I actually don't mind the fact that it's static, right? Most of the time, I would actually appreciate the show being static because its storyboarding does a really good job of conveying, of conveying most of what it wants to convey. One of those things being distance. It, it Mars Red has this abundance of side shots where they, the, the point of the side shot, uh, the, what's emphasized in the side shot is distance. Right, distance between typically two characters, and I guess in, in episode three, there's a case where I had, what's his name? I think his name is Yamagami. Um, he's he's kind of walking down the street, and there's this side shot. And typically, what the show will do is have a side shot with two characters, and they they will be so clearly spaced a, apart, so far spaced apart across the frame, that it actually adds to the tension. It actually creates tension in and of itself because 
they're so separated that it quite literally visualizes a, a difference in perspective in, in opposition or, or a difference in perspective or opposition in perspective. And that's, there are shows that do this. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not surprised if this is commonly a, or if this is a common directing trick or a common storyboarding trick, but it definitely stands out in Mars Red. Uh, there, there is a shot where, again, Yamagami is, he's kind of walking down the street alone, and the distance is between, there's, it's not actually distance per se, it's just like framing him in the bottom third, bottom third or bottom ninth of the shot, and then having like this expansive view of the rest of the shot and like the rest of the city does a good job of visualizing how alone and vulnerable he is, given that he's supposed to be the weakest vampire not necessarily in japan but at least of the crew i have to turn back on my screen i don't know why i just don't you know like turn my computer screen to never sleep but it's whatever and that's that's most of the criticism i think i have there's one there's one other thing that the directing sometimes in mars red doesn't feel nearly as dramatic as it seems like it should in particular there are there are not again because it's so reliant on its storyboarding there aren't visual cues outside of the framing of shots a lot of the times about things that are happening or the the nuances of things that are going on in particular there's a scene where uh, there's a character called Rufus who's introduced who's presumably the antagonist of the show and he there's a scene i guess the ending of his introduction per se just kind of ends on this shot of him staring at the sky but it's not really dramatically presented it's kind of just like this this straight on viewpoint of him staring at the sky something kind of like this he's kind of just talking and it's basically at the same distance that i'm at from you at the camera and so when it just cuts to the next shot and that's supposed to be the end of the introduction it just seems so flatly directed that it's hard to believe that he's the an introduction of an antagonist um now that's presuming he's an antagonist but it would seem to be the case via con via story context that that's actually the case so Da, da, da. There's also a couple of moments where the 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 oddness in directing or the lack of attention or lack of what's the word I'm looking for oomph in directing is very apparent or it's just kind of funny and dramatic moments. There's a female that dies in episode three, and this guy basically just goes like a uh, she's like hey. Can you sing me a song? Because, you know, she's on her deathbed. It, it has stuff to do contextually with the episode. But he, the guy responds like, I really don't know any songs. And she just drops dead. Like, there's no, there's no, like, dramatic directing around it. She just drops dead. I don't know. I found the entire scene very funny. There's feigning of Maeda, who is the main character at the end of episode three. It's kind of like a cliffhanger. There's not really any spoilers there because there's no detail about what the hell is going on. Um, but it, it just came off as very odd because it just kind of happens out of nowhere and there's no emphasis put on the shot. It's just kind of like this wide shot and then he kind of falls and stumbles and whatnot. And I already talked about the introduction of Rufus, so that's basically all I have to say. There was one pretty funny part where Yamagami says something about just talking in falsetto and that was cracking me the fuck up because I was like, how do you even do this? I just sound like a white girl if I try to talk in falsetto, because I don't even know what that means. Yeah, I legitimately don't know how you talk in falsetto, bro. Higashimachi is also a funny city name. This is just something that I randomly noted. In Japanese, that directly translates to uh, East City, Higashimachi. So, just thought that was something worth noting. That's all I've got for Mars Red. We move on to Fumasa no Anata, i.e. to your eternity. That was actually something, that was a piece of feedback I had gotten regarding these podcasts, uh, that... Uh, it, by the way, if you have feedback for the podcast, please let me know because I'm always trying to improve these and trying to include as many people as possible that would actually like to watch the content. But uh, one thing that was brought to my attention was that a lot of people don't necessarily know the Japanese names for these shows. So I should actually start using both the Japanese and English names for the show because similarly, there might be people that know the Japanese names that don't know the English translations, especially for the name To Your Eternity because it's a pretty... I don't like the literal translation because it kind of doesn't make any sense. The literal translation is something along the lines of e to eternity's you, which, again, doesn't make any fucking sense. Most of what I have to talk about with Fumetsu no Anata, uh, Anata A 
to your eternity hilariously enough actually has nothing to do with content of the show I, there's very little to talk about with regarding content of the show there is one thing that i want to talk about that does actually involve something that's in the show which is the idea of what makes a shot iconic because there's a shot in episode two where the main character is reforming his name is Fu, um and his he's like reforming after because he's immortal and it, there's a shot where his eyeball is shooting from the back of his head kind of like back in the frame or back into where it's supposed to be and it's used in the pv i think that shot in like five five to six years is going to be one of the more iconic shots in anime I, I can't necessarily give you a reason why, and I don't want to go into that this episode, but I do think that's something that will eventually end up breaking down. Regarding this episode, or regarding like the past two episodes, I actually want to talk about meta stuff. Not because I think it's necessary, well, part of it could be indicative of the show's quality, but just because I thought it was interesting. So, fun fact, right? So, Pink Blood is the name of the opening. The Fumatsu no Anate opening is fire. We're going to talk about that. That's primarily what we're going to talk about. Um... But yeah, the name of the opening is Pink Blood. And fun fact, this is Hikaru Utada's first anime opening or ED. I'm sorry, TV anime opening or ED, I should say. She's done theme performances for the Ava Rebuild movies. She's done a theme performance for Penguin Highway, which I think came out either a year or two ago. Uh, but it was that movie by Studio Colorido. I don't remember what it was about. I never actually got to watch it, but I do plan on watching it soon. But I found that in very interesting, the fact that she's never done an anime, a TV anime opening or ending, because she's literally the, the best-selling Japanese artist ever. <laughs> so that just blows my fucking mind. Like, it's Hikaru Utada. I can't believe that she's never actually done anything for a TV anime. That is absolutely fucking nuts to me. And I I found that so interesting because she seems to associate herself with things that are in, that are very dramatic uh in regard in regards to anime at least. So Penguin Highway, the Ava build or the Ava rebuilds, they're things that don't necessarily correlate themselves or how should I say this? Uh, found themselves on the core principles of what we consider to be modern anime. They feel very different from modern anime in the sense that a lot of those feel like they could have been live actions. Maybe not Ava in particular, but Ava is, is, the, the, is like a cultural, it's like a cultural icon, right? It, it's it's kind of superseded the idea of anime, and that's kind of what my point was, I guess. She's not necessarily bound to the idea of working on anime, which is why I thought it was kind of interesting that now she's working on her first TV anime. I mean, at that at some point, it was just going to be a matter of time, right? Um, but regarding the opening, because I think that it's actually really good. Uh, one thing that I really like about the opening is the use of overlaid footage. In particular... It, it's used very well because of of one trick in that the the overlaid in regards to the overlaid footage the foreground is always running at a different speed than the background and the clips are tonally different like the clips have this tonal dissonance and that in and of itself leads to this very unsettling feeling the background clips always seem to be slower paced they and they might look somewhat majestic and kind of lucid and dreamlike and then everything in the foreground is just this rapid fire of disturbing shots like zombies or action or just a lot of shit going on and that dissonance i found to be very fucking unsettling and i thought it just works very 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 well the the, the opening's also absolutely fucking gorgeous especially from about its one minute mark basically to the end when there's this uh, this action montage and this storyboarding montage there's like this shot of this uh red stuff shooting out from the oniguma that appears in like the second and third episode i mean it's just shit's just fire bro i didn't really have much to say about the second episode in and of itself nor really the third episode i just thought uh in particular i the the fact that March, March, I was going to say Machi, whatever, uh, who is kind of like this toddler in the show, 
she or i guess toddler's not really the right word she's like five five or six years old right i found the only thing odd about the show that i kind of consider to be a criticism to be she has too good of an understanding of death from what i understand what a child's understanding of death should be around that age um uh, in particular i just think that she her reaction to the thought of to the knowing that she is going to die seems so dreadful it, it, uh, you know like like nuance i guess uh, let me rephrase that uh she seems so aware of the nuances of death that i don't think that most kids are actually aware of around that age and so she has this feeling of absolute dread towards death as opposed to some sort of ignorance towards it and i found that to be kind of jarring Primarily because I just don't think that kids around this age actually do understand all of the nuances of death. Now, I could be entirely wrong on that, which is something that I should be completely transparent about. I don't necessarily know that that's the case. But part of me is just using anecdotal experience. Another part of me is just using intuition because, right, while I may have become cognizant about how severe it was around that age via some stuff that i kind of want to talk about in its own video i actually have a script written about cash and sin and that actually ends up getting mentioned uh but that will come someday after i revise that script because i don't really like how i wrote it uh but while there are some people there are some exceptions to who might understand the nuances of death generally speaking i wouldn't assume for people to know about it that young because Children around the age of five to seven are just subconsciously understanding what the idea of object permanence is, right? Object permanence being that when an object disappears from sight, right, that that object, you understand that that object still continues to exist. Like my arm does no, uh, you know, my hand does not no longer exist simply because it's out of the frame. It's still here. And you are, you were cognizant of that. That's object permanence. So the fact that kids don't even subconsciously understand object permanence until like age five to seven <laughs> leads me to believe that i just don't i just don't understand how she understands the nuances of death like this but it's not really that big of a deal it was just jarring and, and a little immersion breaking and everything else you know around the show kind of works around it and it kind of just treats it as a non-issue so it's not really that big of an issue it's just something that i noticed I also love that this show is entirely uncensored, and this gets into something that's meta about the show regarding its advertising. So the the fact that it's non-censored is particularly interesting because this show airs at 9.50 a.m. in Japan on Mondays, if I'm correct, at least. That's really odd, right? For a show that's, that has used so much blood and shown so much death around this point to be airing so early in the morning, which is typically a time I guess you would you would watch toddlers and stuff watching things, and or people that are not going to school watching things. I just found that so interesting because, you know, obviously decapitation, blood fest, sacrifices, fucking death are not childish themes. So to have a show which is just talking about these things airing at at school time essentially is odd and it makes me wonder if hikaru utada getting on this opening is actually indicative of maybe a marketing process right obviously hikaru utada the biggest japanese artist ever is going to do numbers in regards to advertising and promoting your show and i wonder if the if did I flip the mic around again? I got a bad habit of just randomly flipping this mic around. Uh, I wonder if getting Hikaru Utada on the show is indicative of them attempting to push Blu-rays really, really, really hard because this show airs at a very odd time. And if, you know, relying on Hikaru Utada's endorsement is basically going to be the, the advertising... The, the big advertising push. Uh, critically speaking, there's not really much to say. It's very well directed. I heard somebody complain about the overabundance of music and scenes, which I just flat out disagree with. I, I didn't have any issue with the use of music. I thought that it's, it's pretty typical. Um, there's a great job showing the evolution of Fu's character. Fu being the main character who started off as an orb or a rock and then turns into a dog and then turns into a person. And now his name is Fu as termed by March in the show. He had, the show has this way of showing 
development in a very shocking way every single time that there is a development uh regarding foo at least and i guess by shocking way what i mean is it, the the revelation itself is not necessarily shocking what's really sh what's shocking is uh it, the show just always finds a way to, pre to present the revelation in a very surprising way despite the fact that the audience knows that the revelation is coming so for for example we all knew that eventually he was going to say arigato like he was going to learn to speak what was it it just was regardless jarring when he did it because he did it in dog form it comes off as just this really odd uh awkward scene because you know there's a dog saying arigato like just like that as he stares at the fucking camera and tries to engage the audience and so on and so forth when he learns to eat he does it kind of ravagely like a savage and you know i just think the show does a very 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 good job of making these these learning instances or these obvious instances of learning come off as legitimately surprising despite the fact that we know that they're going to happen let's go ahead and move on to the next show which is hige hero which uh, again was another show that i didn't really plan on talking about it just happened to be that i had enough notes that you know made me do something with the show in particular i really wanted to talk about episode three uh last week when it had aired and how there's a scene there's a bedroom scene right so for people who haven't watched the show there's there's a scene uh the premise of hige hiro or hige osoru uh i actually don't know what the the english title is which is why i kind of can't give it to you everybody pretty much knows the show as hige osoru um but uh maybe i'll have some anecdote on screen there's there's the, the premise of the show is that this guy picks up this girl off of the street quite literally off of the street because she has run away from home and she's sitting under a lamppost and it turns out this this is this girl has been selling her body to stay in people's houses because she's been running away like a nomad um and she she's just learning because this guy yoshida does not want to he doesn't want to actually have sex with her he doesn't want to sexually sexually abuse will use i guess uh, he doesn't want to sexually abuse her or have any sort of sexual relations with her because, you know, he just doesn't see that that's right. We'll come back to that point in, in like, a minute. That's the premise of the show. So, there's a, there's a scene in episode three where Sayu, who's the girl that he picked up off the street, is very... She still doesn't understand why Yoshida does, basically does not ask for anything in return. He doesn't ask for sex. He doesn't plead for it. She starts to feel unattractive. She starts to feel as if she's just freeloading off of this guy. And this scene is really good. But it's it's an odd case of I don't know if this scene accomplished what it what it wanted to accomplish and the method in which it it seeked to accomplish it or sought to accomplish it, I should say. Uh, so in particular, the, uh, what I what I want to talk about is, I don't think that the disturbing part of this scene. So let let me describe the scene for people who haven't seen it. Uh, uh, essentially, Sayu basically strips down to her underwear, and she attempts. Uh, Sayu is seventeen. Uh, Yoshida, who's the who's the main guy that she's staying with, is twenty six. She strips down to her underwear, and she attempts to approach the guy, and she, uh, tries to seduce him. And eventually, it gets to the point where she actually starts rubbing his crotch. And he has to, like, push her off and blah, 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 etc. And Yoshida has kind of set the precedence that he doesn't want her to ever try to seduce him. He wants her to just learn to find value outside of her sexual marketplace value. And so that's, so that's a basic description of the scene. And eventually he, he coaxes her into understanding that she doesn't have to be there for sexual reasons. And that she can be attractive without him wanting to fuck her. Um... The scene, again, the scene's really good, but what I found in particularly disturbing, right, is that what what most people, I feel like, at least what I felt, when I was watching this scene, what's disturbing is not necessarily the fact that she saw herself, she that Sayu finds her value solely in her sexual marketplace value. What's disturbing to most Western viewers, I would presume, is that she's 17, right? It doesn't matter that 
I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It matters less that she finds value, that basically she accumulates all of her value and whatever she can provide via sexual means. To a Western viewer, I think what was more jarring is just the general idea that she's underaged and is trying to seduce a 26-year-old man. And that I found particularly interesting uh, because it's just it just doesn't seem to be what the show itself is attempting to push. What the show itself attempts to push is the idea, again, of sexual marketplace value does not define you as a woman. And that's fair, but... It, when it continually stresses the idea of this girl being a high school girl, right? It, it constantly does this via dialogue, especially in moments like this. Like, I think there's a line that's something like, uh, don't you think my boobs are pretty big for a high school girl or something along the lines like that. As a Westerner, what makes me sick there is the addition of the word high school girl. It's not the sexualization of her. It's the fact that she's a high school girl and she's being sexualized and that she's underage. It has nothing to do with the fact that she finds value in her sexual marketplace or, or like uh, that all of her value is, reg is in regards to sexual appeal. I just found that really interesting, again, because that's just not seemingly what the show is attempting to do, yet it's still got its point across during the scene. Uh, it just seems that what the, the point that the show is trying to push just ends up becoming a side point. Uh, it just ends up becoming a side theme. And uh, by the way, I ended up doing some looking stuff up regarding Age of Consent laws because I was actually curious if that, if the show attempting to address and bring up the idea, again, of value and sexual appeal was just a result of it being in Japan, right? And if Japanese age of consent laws differed so much from the US that maybe the difference in how the message got across in the show was just a result of context, if it was just a result of legal context regarding where the show is set, I don't believe that to be the case. I just, uh, and here's why. Uh, so the show is set in Tokyo. It never explicitly says this. I am, I am drawing upon this assumption via a couple of things. Number one, in the opening, there are shots that are just, you know, resemblant of Tokyo. In particular, there's one shot that is obviously downtown Tokyo. It's like a square in Tokyo uh, with the 100 FM tower. And I mean, like, if you just type in Japanese square or Japan square on Google Images, it's literally the first image that comes up. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's definitely set in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, the, the age of consent law, or the age of consent is actually 18 in most places. So, nationwide, in Japan, the age of consent is 13. But in Tokyo, a lot of sexual, most pro sexual activity under the age of 18, from what I found, um, is prohibited. Sources could be entirely incorrect on that, but that's what I ended up finding. Which means that under Western nor Japanese context is the uh, is this legal, right? It, it is the idea of him having sex with Sayu legal, and I think that's important because it also is crucial to the idea of character, or it's crucial to Yoshida's characterization, right? Yoshida is characterized as a good guy because he does not take advantage of Sayu. Well, I mean, like, it's hard to see somebody as a good guy when you're essentially praising him for not committing statutory rape, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I, like, yeah, good job, woohoo! You didn't rape somebody, yay! Yeah, let's go get it. Uh, you, you deserve a cookie, like, what? I don't know. I, I just found that very odd for his characterization. Um, it would be odd if he didn't deny her because then we would just think of Yoshida as a criminal and a fucking creep. Uh, speaking of this this entire topic, uh, when I brought up the idea that this show takes place in Tokyo, uh, when I was doing, when I was trying to find hints within the background regarding where the show could possibly be set, I gotta say, it's gotta be set because I don't think anybody said this. The backgrounds for the show are fucking awful. <laughs> Like, they're fucking terrible. They stink. Dog shit. 
there is like no detail in setting pieces. There's like nothing going on in these backgrounds, right? There's this scene where they're walking down the street and there's just nothing on the street except like a sign that points towards parking towards like the end of the street. If you go within Yoshida's house, I guess it makes sense contextually speaking in Yoshida's house, but there's no like pattern walls. There's nothing that's happening on any of the of any of the walls and things of the sort. And again, that can that contextually makes sense in Yoshida's house, but even in work environments, there's not a bunch of things on like boards and things of the sort. There's not a bunch of things happening in city environments and street environments and things like that. It's just noticeably dull in regards to backgrounds. Uh, and again, I wouldn't have noticed that had I not had to go try to find stuff regarding where the show was set so that I could actually accurately, you know, find things regarding the age of consent in Japan, um, specifically because Tokyo's age of consent and how it handles sexual relations with minors is just different from, generally speaking, how the rest of Japan may handle the age of consent and sexual uh, issues with minors and so on and so forth. But I just had to bring up that that the backgrounds just fucking stuck. Uh, you know, they they just stink, dude. <laughs> Uh, episode 4, because there's not really anything to talk about with Episode 3, because it, generally speaking, the show just evolves into a very typical romance. Episode 4, uh, we gotta talk about, because there is something interesting that happens, and uh, specifically towards the, the, the scene in the episode where Yoshida meets up with his crush, uh, who's named Goto-san, right? And... Previously, these two met up. If you watched an episode that I think I did, I, I think it was either for week one or maybe it was week two or something. <laughs> I don't fucking know. I, I, I think it might have been... I, I don't know when the fuck I last talked about Hige Osoto in full review. But we talked about um, the idea that Goto is, you know, would go on a date with somebody despite the fact that she's been dating somebody for five years or she goes on what's quote unquote a date but not officially date a date despite the fact that she's she's had a boyfriend apparently for five years turns out according to the show if you've not seen uh this is a spoiler so i'll give you like a couple seconds to click off or blah 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 okay cool I mean, you probably could have presumed this anyways, because I think I had actually predicted this in the first time that I talked about the show, but uh, Goto does not have a boyfriend of five years. It was a fucking lie, right? <laughs> Which, in and of itself, is absolutely ridiculous, and I couldn't help but just... it. I don't know, it led to this really interesting interaction while I was watching the show, right? That interaction being that that scene where she confesses that the boyfriend that she has is fake... Um, feels more like the show attempting to persuade you that what is actually the truth is actually the truth. <laughs> and I left that scene not thinking what was the truth was the truth, but just accepting that it was, if that makes sense. So, in other words, the show didn't actually persuade me that Yoshida is being truthful, or I'm sorry, that uh, Goto is being truthful about her love for Yoshida, it just made me accept it, which is something that I didn't like. And I'll I'll go into detail about this, right? So, Yoshida doesn't believe this bullshit either. <laughs> I gotta I gotta call it out for what it is. It's bullshit. All right, having a boyfriend of five years. Why would you go to this fucking line? This is so nonsensical, right? It, it and then the show attempts, you know, after after she presents the fact that she's been lying this entire time. She the show presents or attempts to present her as this really empathetic figure and it's fucking impossible seemingly to do this effectively right because her lie is just so absurd dude but i you know boy for fake boyfriend of five years is just an odd lie to rely on and so again the show ends up turning into uh a sort of how, how i mean there's not really any other way to say it. it just tries to persuade you into believing that goto is actually in love with the guy and so there are attempts to make her seem empathetic but they don't work because i'm constantly seeing her as a moron because her fallback lie was not that like uh sorry i'm seeing somebody else or sorry you know i mean it was seeing i'm seeing somebody else but it was seeing somebody else with the modifier of for five years i've been seeing them 
it wasn't it wasn't something like I just don't have time to date anybody right now, which would have which would have worked. I mean, that's essentially the reason that she ends up giving the words I mean, in the episode, anyways. That just wasn't she gave a reasoning or an excuse that just does not make any fucking sense that I just cannot see anybody in any reasonable context making. And as a result, I can't help to see her, but as anything but kind of a fucking moron. Um, and even though Yoshida seems convinced towards the end of the episode or towards the end of the scene, I found myself entirely unfucking convinced that she actually does care, uh, primarily because even though the directing seems to, you know, persuade you into believing so, I just this all works on the premise that what she said previously was a lie and it's just hard for me to find any sort of you know credibility in that idea that it, that is a lie that you would rely on you know it's just very unrealistic for a show that seemingly has been grounded in reality this entire time and what's even more unrealistic is that Yoshida is just putting up with this bullshit primarily because he quote unquote loves the woman um, but I just feel like in most dating places and, or, and in most contexts, this is just not something that number one happens. And I don't think that this is something that most males actually put up with, even if it does happen. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that scene and the lie alone discredits Goto from what is supposedly, I guess it's not, a, I guess it is a love triangle, uh, because that's quite literally how a triangle is formed. It's not a love uh, a love tree like if you if you have three if you have three people that like the same guy I guess technically that's called a harm but I mean like can we call it a love tree because I mean it's basically like it's like a tertiary tree who cares I'm a CS major I'm a fucking loser um also I was like I said I technically was correct I predicted the first week that Yoshida uh that Goto would break up with her boyfriend of five years and then have a crush on Yoshida and blah 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 and technically I wasn't incorrect I mean she did break up with this guy i mean she broke up with this imaginary fucking creature she had created um <laughs> and that and that ended up being that also uh last thing i gotta say yoshida you don't miss out on beef stew night dog especially not when it's cooked by an asian woman let me tell you beef stew cooked by asian woman might be the single greatest delicacy that any man can have I, I'm speaking from experience. I've had that Asian beef stew. I've had it cooked when it's cooked with love and care. And I've not had it in like two years. And it's rough. It's tough. But you don't skip beef stew night, buddy. That's, that's just a fucking L, bro. That's a fucking L. I don't give a fuck how big Goto's titties are. You don't skip beef stew night. We got to get to 86. That's, that's the next show. I'm looking for my water bottle. It's actually all the way up here. Let me go ahead and get that real quick i need a drink of water i've actually unlocked my my camera's record limit so i can actually just do this for a straight hour it looks like we've got basically 45 minutes of recording left and that's good because i i have two shows left to talk about and each of them i have a lot of shit to say uh at 86 we got a lot to talk about like a whole fucking lot the first thing we need to talk about is this is an idea that scrolls brought up to me um, when he was first watching, or before I watched uh, the second episode of 86, he basically said that the second episode could replace the first episode. And I thought that that was a really interesting comment to make, because again, I hadn't watched it yet. Then I watched the second episode of 86, and he's entirely fucking correct. I don't understand why the fuck the first episode exists. You you could entirely omit the first episode from the show, and you would have a significantly better show if you did so. <laughs> um... Let's talk about why that's the case. There's one fucking scene. There's one scene that renders the entire first episode useless. And if this one scene was used and we just started from episode two, the show would have been in a better state to start with, right? Um, there's a scene where Dana, uh, the, the main female who works for the Capitol, she's against the idea of these 86, these people who are basically banished to this 86 district, being treated as pigs and being sacrificed in wars and stuff solely because they don't have white eyes and, and white hair and blah, 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 etc. They look different, right? It's essentially racism. And she's not, she's not fucking with racism, right? Props to Lena, bro. I'm not fucking with racism. 
know what it is. Anyways. Here's why this scene is so good, right? I mean, it basically covers everything that episode one attempted to cover, but so much better. <laughs> um, for one, it's tonally consistent across the whole thing. You know, the idea of tone switching, which I harped on so fucking hard in the first episode, has been a non-issue for the entirety of these of these other two episodes. Well, not the entirety, but it, it's largely been a non-issue. It's basically only appeared once, reappeared once, and it reappeared at a much uh, less annoying much less abrupt level, and I'll talk about that later, but again, this scene is totally consistent. Number two, which is the biggest thing here, I, I, I talked to somebody in the comment section about the idea of one-dimensional enemies and how the show is just establishing these one-dimensional enemies and what at first was a really cool establishing scene when Nana is first like walking through the city and such, and it, it uses like this new broadcast or news broadcast under it to, you know, to show propaganda about how people believe that there's no casualties happening in war and blah, 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 blah. And when she gets into this building, the first thing that the show does is show these really one-dimensional fucking people that are in the Capitol that are just one-dimensionally racist, right? And I just thought that that was stupid because there's more nuance to the situation. And the show seems to understand that there are more. there's more nuance to the situation. Yet it just portrays its its own enemies or its own its, its people that are inherently the racist or antagonist as so incredibly one-dimensional and this does not happen in the second episode right this scene where dana is uh for context i guess i should have explained this first the scene that i'm talking about in the in the in the uh second episode is dana who again is the main female is in this conference hall or i guess like this lecture hall and she's she gets called down to talk about the the military and the 86 and blah 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 and she gives this entire spiel and introduction about what the 86 is why they exist she's like pointing at charts as she's doing all of this so so it, it prevents the sh this from being this kind of lame uneventful uh static looking info dump um she's she's there's a lot of very good character acting so on and so forth it's very well directed uh, so, in just in just in a presentation standpoint, it's significantly stronger than the info dumps are in episode one. But also, right, the the people in the crowd, the students who are ignorant, are portrayed as the antagonists, and that's so much more nuanced than just taking these people that are just sitting in the Capitol and making them antagonists that are just constantly. Uh, berating the 86 on the basis of we're commanders and ha 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 racism blah 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 funny right it this is just a far more nuanced way of of showing the antagonist because the students are antagonists purely off of the fact that they are alba and because they're ignorant which it's not necessarily their fault per se. It's it's the fault of propaganda of the capital. Um, I that's just severely more nuanced. It's not one dimensional. It's not just ha 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 racism funny. We were killing fucking people. Uh, moreover, uh, the, this is a much more natural introduction to the world, right? I thought that the that the first episode has this bad issue of portraying information that the characters in the show should already know. Uh, the information regarding the 86, I guess, like, when it was first revealed, isn't too absurd to have done it that way, because, again, like, Nana didn't know about the 86 at that point, so I guess it made sense to do it via that flashback. But there's other information regarding, like, Potted Aid um, and history about the capital that was explained to uh, Nana and other people, like, the audience, or the people in the show... That made it seem as if the show was speaking to the people watching the show instead of speaking in its own universe. And that's very immersive breaking. That's very jarring. And that didn't happen in this episode because Nana is talking to this group of students who is ignorant. Specifically in the scene, right? So it's just way more natural. It's a much more natural way of exposition. So, I mean, the show pretty much addressed all of my fucking criticisms of its first episode in one scene. And I don't know why people were really, you know, like, arguing with me about this. Because, if, you know, like, if they were cognizant of the fact that this is going to happen later on, I, there's not really anything to argue about. Like, this this scene could single-handedly replace most of the first episode. Um, 
what else is there? Because there's also something else about this. Yes, uh, telling us why the 86 are the 86. I found this to be an issue in the first episode, right? Because there, there's a bunch of exposition and info dumping that happens in 86's first episode, and none of it tells you why the 86 are banished uh, or the 80, why they are the 86. And I found that to be a particularly damning issue because if you're going to info dump me on shit, you might as well info dump me on everything. Like, don't attempt to make certain shit a mystery. You've already talked my fucking ear off. You've bored me to death. You might as well give me more information. And yet they tried to shroud it in mystery and it just made things confusing and it made the situation seem underdeveloped despite the fact that it was just the first episode because, again, they had already been dumping information. There was no reason not to dump this as well. Um, but this, again, this episode doesn't do that. You want to know why? Because they just use one line of dialogue to tell you why the 86 have been banished to being the 86 because they have different skin color or they have, they have different hair color different eye color and that's it and i don't know why the first episode didn't do that but i'm happy that the second episode does it and that the the lecture scene is just very good <laughs> it's very good at establishing the world it should have been the introduction scene of the show um the action's really well done i think Sawano is perfect for shows like this i don't think anybody really disagrees with that the cg is very nicely animated it's very well choreographed additionally i think that the cg works very well for the robots in particular i think cg just has this really rough metallic rusty looking uh rusty aesthetic that works in a gritty war setting like this so i think that the choice of cg for the the action is very good and the action is just very well choreographed and storyboarded so i mean yeah episode three let's talk about it uh because I do think that this is where a lot of the interesting stuff about 86 really comes into play. And it's not just me, you know, giving the show its props for not being ass. <laughs> I can actually talk about things that the show does that are really interesting. All right. So I don't understand uh, before I, you know, before I start off with, you know, all the praise and stuff. Why did the homies push Daya into, uh, you know getting stoned by a bunch of females like i don't understand what's going on there for people who haven't watched the episode there there's a perv scene right like these guys are going to look at these women at the beach and you know like two of the guys sell sell daya out seemingly for no reason like they just push him out in the open like why would you do your homie like that bro like i, I you thought she was gonna get away with that shit too the fuck is wrong with you bro i'm getting beat i'm getting beat with my niggas bro anyways 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 there is a bit of a an, of an abrupt tone switch again i said that the tone switches don't entirely dissolve themselves there is there was one that i found an issue with uh in episode three which is at the end of this beach scene there's a girl who's laughing her name is kudena and uh she of the shot uh, basically the show will tone switch it, it it scene switches from her laughing to her immediately slamming down this cup and there's like this backside shot of her the the, the shot itself actually transitions well which is I'm, a, I'm about to get to this in a second uh the tone switch was abrupt but this makes far more sense narratively speaking than any of the tone switches in the first episode because the tone switches in the first episode were done for shock value and it just comes off as tonally inconsistent but in this episode, Kudena, right, this tone switch, this is a good tone switch, right? Because narratively speaking, it makes sense because uh, the tone switch actually does happen out of nowhere. Like, like in context, Kudena is sitting in this living room with everybody else, and uh, Nana is calling the squadron the 86 at this time. And Kudena gets mad about the idea that uh, uh, just the Alba in general, the the people that are forcing them to be the 86. And her anger comes out of nowhere. And that's reflected in the fact that the tone switch literally happens out of nowhere. This is a narrative use of a tone switch. This is when tone switching works, right? There's not very many contexts in which tone switching works, but this is one of them. And I'm happy that the show kind of learned how to use one. Uh, additionally, uh, there's there's nuances to why the tone switch works uh for example there's there's a transition period you know like the the slamming of the cup on the table is abrupt but also the time when kudena walks out of the room to the uh, to the to the intermediate shots one of them being sheen reading the book and side glancing and blah 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 there's there are just intermediate shots that help with transitioning the tone uh from this very happy com comedic based tone to something that's more serious and that helps. 
because it doesn't feel nearly as abrupt. It just seems it the the abruptness seems controlled. Also, again, the shot transition is nice. Um, this uh, from her laughing to the back of her head, um, slamming down this cup. It's just a it's not a jarring transition. It's a more clever transition than just uh flashing a fucking lens flare or you know just doing like a hard cut and basically doing an AMV cut uh, to show war is abrupt. That's bullshit. That's that's not even <laughs> it's not even a good narrative reason. Um, there's a cool panning shot of the library that I thought was cool. I think that's probably been the best shot in the show. The portrayal of voice calls. Here's where we get to the interesting stuff. So I have two things to talk about that are actually really interesting about 86. First thing is the portrayal of voice calls and why why the show is so effective at them and why that's a big thing. And the second thing is the the portrayal of the disconnect between the battlefield and the command station so we'll talk about the voice calls first this show when Nana is uh so so one thing about the show for people who don't watch Nana does this voice call with people in the 86 every day right because she is attempting to befriend the 86 she thinks that she's doing more to help the 86 than other people are in the capital and this uh, this voice call of this episode is actually there's it's portrayed via a front on shot of Nana, pretty much that's just rolling for a minute and fifty seconds straight. This shot does not change for a minute and fifty seconds straight. It's the same straight on shot, her talking, and it's just her doing character acting and character movement and showing emotion and like confusion and things of the sort. And I just found this to be fucking amazing. <laughs> I just found myself so enthralled with how well, how immersed I felt watching. I felt like I was watching something more analogous to like a Twitch live stream and watching people discuss and seeing character acting via a voice call like this just seems so much more uh, nuanced and personal than seeing something like text in a show like do da 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 which which even though that show does texting very well and dramatically and presents the te texting in very interesting ways it doesn't feel nearly as personal as watching somebody's uh expressions change and their body movement change over time and interpreting their character acting i just i would like to see shows do stuff like this a lot more i thought that this was very 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 immersive um, and I think the show should do this more as well. Uh, I've not seen something like this in previous shows. Just people uh, sitting sitting on a voice call like this, sitting in front of their computer, and it being portrayed so accurately. Now, there are, there are instances in anime of people just being on phone calls um, and the same thing happening, but it is slightly different watching, watching a more modernized version of this exact, uh, you know, a voice call, a, a phone call to voice call. It's, it's nice to see it modernized. Um, for things like Discord and Skype and things of this. Who the fuck uses Skype? <laughs> Anywho, the second thing I wanted to talk about, the disconnect between the battlefield and uh, the command room, which I don't think was portrayed very well in the first episode, right? Like, because the first episode does this, this it shows the dissonance, number one, by showing the two, uh, the two fields uh, in mutually exclusive halves. Like, they basically have no overlap with each other. Um, so the war half of the first episode is entirely separated from the, the other half of the episode, which is just info dumping and exposition and the first episode. Uh, I don't think that's particularly effective because you could be using the two, uh, settings to, to juxtapose against each other. Right. Um, and the other thing is cause I, I scrolled down out of my fucking notes. Uh, blah, 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 where did I go? Here we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, there's also significant buildup to, uh, the, what eventually ends up being a death and, like, an explosion, essentially, of, uh, emotions towards the end of the episode, right? Um, in particular, we get a very detailed overview of the... Uh, the battle via this this monitor that Dana is watching. Um, and this is important because we need context of what is actually going on. And it actually kind of makes me want to retract the statement that I stated earlier about uh, it being necessarily a very bad, not necessarily being a bad thing, but it 
the the showing of these two different fields and settings being mutually exclusive being a bad thing because it's not necessarily a bad thing if this is the only way uh that uh this scene in particular would work the reason part of why this scene in particular works um the scene i'm referring to being the one right before the end of the episode when somebody dies again um this scene works because we the viewer have context as to what the battlefield is like and how brutal it can be and the the consequences of death within the battlefield because they've been previously established in the show um and so it might not actually be possible for us to have the sense of urgency that we would have if we didn't have context regarding or the the exact context of the first episode's battles and how things had ended so I guess that's fair enough. Uh, but anyways, the visualization of the battle on the monitors is very important for this for this episode working. And I thought the visualization here, you know, quite literally showing the battle and letting the audience imagine what the hell is going on is much better than just the previous visualization, which was uh, after an atone, abrupt tone switch, Dana is freaking the fuck out. And uh, essentially, there's a very masculine female voice that's you know attempting to be daunting and whatnot and is essentially screaming the idea of death 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 go deal with the undertaker like i you know it's 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 immature and aside from it being immature it just has no nuance to it again but this is different because this has a lot of nuance because this basically covers the entirety of the battle the uh, all of the strategy that's happening throughout the show and so on and so forth Condition, or, or, la, 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 positions of combatants and things of the sort. The ending scene. We got to talk about this because the ending scene is so good. So that was basically all I had with the with the disconnect um, between Dana and the party. I just think that the disconnect uh, be, is shown so fucking well between what is happening on the field and why Dana feels so isolated and things of the sort. Uh, one thing, one of these things is carryover into this last scene because this is really when that is exemplified the, the the disconnect is exemplified uh the ending scene basically Dana gets berated on being a hypocrite um which i don't necessarily agree with but i don't really want to get into that because i think that's kind of a conversation of the show and it's not really a criticism i don't, I don't want to get into that right now because what i'm more focused on is uh the presentation of this shot and the uh the, the combination of the things i just listed with the disconnect between Nana and the and the people of the 86 alongside uh the what was uh what what was the thing i was talking about before you see this is why you have notes ha 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 the voice calls <laughs> and the voice calls the combination of these things right forms into this final scene in which Nana is being berated and it's very she's freaking out but this freaking out is much more personal because it's this front on shot of the voice calls like we were talking about and we talked about why those work um and it's also the 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 apparent disconnect that she has from being on the battlefield and sitting behind the monitor it's just so obvious with how the show is framed how it isolates her in the center of the frame how uh before it isolates her and starts berating her it shows this back shot where she's isolated in this very small corridor in this very small room everything combines to create this scene where Dana just seems isolated, alone, trapped, and helpless, and it works. So, wow. I just don't understand why, the, why, dude, just, can we just act like the first episode of 86 doesn't exist? Can we just start rating this show from the second episode and go on and so forth? Because <laughs> it's been pretty good since then. It's been pretty good since its second episode. That's that's basically all I've got. The only other the only thing I had to criticize really with that episode is that the uh, there's a tear transition that happens at the end where Nana like sheds a tear and it does you know like the tear drops and then it does like this weird AMV ish transition where the 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 shot basically flips and then the tear is actually like this glimmer or this lens flare within some sort of pot or vase of a of a plant or a flower or things of the sort. And I just thought that that was hilarious because that just seemed like such a forced transition that I personally have implemented in edits of my own. I just thought, you know, it stood out to me. It stood out to me as, as, a, as a video editor because I'm like, that's, I mean, kind of clever, but also 
not kind of clever, kind of obvious what you were attempting to do there, and I don't think it looks nearly as cool uh, as a result of it being obvious, but generally speaking, 86 has been solid. It's been very solid. I have to talk about Odd Taxi. And there's a lot to talk about with Odd Taxi, which makes me wonder if I'm going to segment it off into its own show, which I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to I think I'm going to segment off Odd Taxi into its own episode. I was going to cover Odd Taxi in this episode, but Odd Taxi episode four is probably a 20 to 30 minute discussion, and we're already over like an hour and 10 minutes. And I don't want number one, I don't want my computer to have to render a video from uh, that's over like an hour and 20 or what whatnot. Number two, I'm going to re run out of recording space. I'm going to do another video on Odd Taxi. It will probably be published the day after this podcast airs. So it will be published probably around 11 a.m. Saturday. And there's just a ton of shit to talk about with Odd Taxi. Episode four of Odd Taxi is probably the best episode of anime I've seen all year. And that's why I don't want to cut it short I don't want to. I don't want to rush this into like 20 minutes because it probably is going to take 30 to 40 minutes. Odd Taxi has also been a very personal show. I remember after the very first episode that I watched, or not the very first episode. I watched the first two episodes. I guess it was the first three episodes because we're in the fourth episode now. So I guess it was the first three episodes, and I was very emotional after watching the first three episodes. I found that the show just again without getting into too many specifics just has this way of accurately portraying issues in regards to to dating uh the idea of age gaps within dating and showing and portraying them in a way that's both respectable and kind of something that you would like uh, that that's to be desired the the presence of social media and some of the reasons of why it's so toxic it's it's just both so accurate in its portrayal and personal in its portrayal that I found myself using the show as a lens for reflection uh, a lot of the time. And uh, also, the show is just beautifully, beautifully, intricately connected. The The use of the combination of storylines, um, or the combination, the meeting of these various storylines within the show is superseding something along the likes of Dudarada and Bakano, which are known for this thing. And I think that this is probably going to be the gold standard for that type of story. This this type of anachronistic storytelling. Anach anachronistic, intricately woven storytelling. And it's even better upon rewatch because unlike Bakano and Dudarada, right, where the narrative just kind of converges, um, in, uh, you know, to a degree, this... An odd taxi, like the convergence, is visually represented. Like this is this is an, uh, similar to Cultic Nine in that the show is just visually fucking dense, um, which is a good thing. There's just so much going on visually. Backgrounds are great, unlike something like Higa Hero. Oh my God, kill me! <laughs> uh, backgrounds in this show are great. They're very detailed, and. Uh, even the people that are interacting and walking within the backgrounds are very important. Everything, there's so much attention to detail. Um, that's that's a lot of what I'm getting at with this show is visually dense. I know I, I think I just said that I wasn't going to go into talking about Odd Taxi, but I figured there, there there's enough for me to generally overview about the show without getting into episode four in particular, which is going to get its own video. Um, because I don't, I just don't have enough time to talk about episode four because there's too much to talk about. Um, but generally speaking, my my overview, my oh, my thoughts on Odd Taxi is so far it's the best show of the season by a mile. It's the only show I have rated at an eight so far. Uh, it is also the, uh, the it maybe it's a seven and everything else is like a six or a five. Point being, it's a it's a full point higher than whatever the next best show is, um, which is probably Jordan. And additionally, it's very personal. It, it has a lot of insightful commentary, a lot of insightful means for doing reflection, and I, I it's just so fucking immersive that I just found myself being very emotionally attached and rewatching the show without uh, outside of the podcast, like rewatching the show simply because I wanted to use it as a means to reflect. Um, Odd Taxi is the best show of the season. It's probably the best show that's aired so far of the year. 
And if it keeps like this, uh, it's gonna be a modern classic. Like, I, I don't think there's anything, I, there's nothing left to say regarding that, right? Like, it, if Odd Taxi keeps at the pace it's been going, it is very easily going to be a modern classic. And it's going to be one of those shows uh, that may not be in the same, uh, you know, elitist category of things like Tatami Galaxy and Yaiba and blah, 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 blah. But it's generally going to be associated with those shows in ways that are not simply based on how abstract it kind of is. Um, it's just very, 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 very good. I will talk about episode four in its own video because there's just a lot to talk about with episode four. I don't want to cut myself short because it's going to take more than the 20 minutes or technically the 10 minutes that I have left of recording time. So we're going to go ahead and end the episode there. We're going to actually end the episode there. I know I previously said we were going to end the episode, but we, did, but we clearly fucking did it because our taxi's that nigga, you know. So overall thoughts we can go through and review this stuff again uh all of the speed reviews are the speed reviews i don't even remember them nagatoto's uh fun and solid or uh, yeah it, it's fun i it, it's whatever uh, i don't really have any issues with it i unironically enjoy it shadow's house is still this really far developed or this developing mystery so there's not really much to talk about it but it does creepy very fucking well megalobox uh has been very good so oh, let, let me change that not very good it's been good so far it's been clearly good i would probably give it somewhere around the lines of a say like a high six uh maybe a low seven like a seven flat something like that jordan is good as shit but we have not talked about it because there's more to talk about with jordan than would warrant me talking about it for just five to ten minutes marsh red production in regards to motion is rather inconsistent but its production everywhere else is very consistent i like its use of wide shots uh i thought that it's it's introduction or it's it's ability to make the audience kind of want to do their own research about the historical context in japan has been very interesting to me to your eternity what a great fucking opening oh my goodness hikaru utada working on an anime a tv anime might be indicative of the show's quality and i'm curious to see where this goes hige uh, hige osoru hige hiro uh third episode talks about abandonment i think that the scene in the bedroom uh is very good however it gets across for reasons that i don't think that the show intends uh and so i have to question about uh whether or not that scene is good from i guess a a uh or how should i say this uh it just doesn't get across the message that it wants to get across in the way that it is seeking to which i just found to be funny it, it just gets across an entirely different message and i'm not sure if that actually hints at failure towards the scene or if that's just what it is uh additionally goto lying about you know this lie that goto told uh and the show attempting to make her seem empathetic doesn't work um, I, I had a hard time believing it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. 86 can, should just delete its first episode, act like it never existed, delete all the fucking evidence, hide the fucking, hide the jet fuel, you know, you know what it is. Film melts steel beams. Uh, it does this really good job. 86 also does a really good job of uh showing the dissonance between the battlefield and the people behind the monitor and so on and so forth as well as uh its final scene is just kind of fantastic and the use of voice calls is very intricate and odd taxi we just talked about odd taxi so that's all i've got so now you've gotten your quick overview of all the shows that we talked about that's all i've got for today that's all i've got for this week technically not all i've got for this week because we still got that odd taxi episode four video today that's gonna be fire Anyways, thank you for watching. If you guys did enjoy, please leave a like, comment, and as always, I will see you guys in the next video. My cryptos are up, baby. I'm not in Dogecoin yet, but my cryptos are up. You know what it is. You know what it is, homie. You know what it is. We make money out here. We make money out here. I mean, my choice is so fucking hard. We make money out here. I can I can walk away looking like a bitch. Okay. I'll see y'all later. Deuce. Wait by the water side for me. It's not fun, like